Um, the next presentation is icing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Dan Bauer from the Office of Research and Engineering will give the presentation Reduced Dangers to Aircraft Icing Flying in, er, Aircraft Flying in Icing Conditions. Good afternoon. I'm here to provide a status on the actions to reduce dangers to aircraft flying in icing conditions. As a result of two major icing accident investigations in the 90s and several recent accidents and, and incidents, the Safety Board issued a series of recommendations that asked for expedited research into the effects of all types of airframe icing, especially the effects of freezing rain, large droplets, critical ice shapes, and de-ice boot operation, all which were factors in those accidents and continue to be factors in the recent accidents and incidents. We have asked for upgraded icing certification standards that specifically take into account the effects of freezing rain and supercooled large droplets, the development of improved detection and protection systems, and improvements to operational procedures in icing conditions. These broad, sweeping recommendations address icing certification for all aircraft and apply the upgraded standards to both newly certified and currently certificated airplanes. All are currently open unacceptable status with the exception of AO714. There have been some recent actions by the FAA to address some of these recommendations. In April of 2007, the FAA issued an NPRM regarding the activation of ice protection systems on newly manufactured Part 25 airplanes certified for flight and icing conditions, and the Safety Board provided comments to the FAA on the NPRM. The final rule was issued in August of 2009 and requires ice protection system activation as soon as the airplane enters icing conditions. Additionally, in December of last year, the FAA issued an NPRM regarding the activation of ice protection systems on in-service airplanes that are currently certified for flight and icing conditions. The NPRM only covers Part 121 operations, and the Safety Board is providing comments to the FAA. The recent rules address some of our icing recommendations related to de-ice boot operation. However, Recommendation A96-54 has not yet been fully addressed by the FAA. This recommendation requests that a full range of icing conditions, including supercooled large droplets, or SLD, are used in icing certification testing. This includes freezing rain, freezing drizzle, and freezing mist. A recent accident in January of last year in Lubbock, Texas, helped stress the need for consideration of SLD in icing certification. The Safety Board recently held a public hearing on this accident, so uh, I will only discuss some of the factual information determined by the investigation at this point. The airplane was dispatched and flew into freezing drizzle, which is not currently required to be examined during icing certification. This accident involved a sl flap asymmetry that occurred during the approach, an autopilot disconnect with a stick shaker, the first officer suggested a go-around, the captain said no, and the captain took control of the airplane. The airplane impacted the ground 300 feet short of the runway and was destroyed in a post-crash fire. Airframe icing was noted by the flight crew, and testimony obtained during the public hearing indicated it affected the captain's go-around decision. At this stage of the investigation, the aircraft icing does not appear to have a large influence on the performance of the aircraft. However, performance calculations also show a worsening situation during the freezing drizzle encounter. For this accident, the investigation is continuing, but it demonstrates, like the ATR accident in the 90s, that flight crews are encountering icing conditions for which they are not certified and which need to be considered as requested 
and Recommendation A9654. FAA testimony from the public hearing on the Lubbock accident indicate that the FAA received a proposal from the ARAC for an expanded icing envelope to include SLD in 2005, and an NPRM is expected in the first quarter of this year. However, a final rule that requires these conditions be considered and icing certification is still pending. This concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Member Sumwalt. On page 30, we say, and I'm reading at the bottom of the report, page 30, a search of the NTSB's accident database revealed no accidents related to ice bridging. Well, how do we know if ice bridging is present? Because by the time we get there, the airplane's crashed, it's burned up. So how, how would we be able to determine that ice bridging was a factor? Ice bridging by its own definition, requires an ice accretion aft of the ice protection system to support a bridge as bridging is thought to occur. For that severe type of icing accretion, that would um, certainly have a large effect on the performance of the airplane, and certainly the conditions required to create a bridge as it's thought to occur, which we don't think we've ever seen, would have to be extremely severe, and we just haven't encountered that. Okay, and I thought ice bridging was, was going to be where, where it basically got stuck between the boots, between the pneumatic tubes that inflate the de-icing de -icing boots. It is, and well, ice bridging is thought to be that the boot is inflating underneath the ice and okay. not able to crack it. Okay. Um, it's, I've, we've kind of seen that there might be somewhat of a misconception that some pilots might see a less effective boot operation, a less effective clear as a bridging, and it isn't. Those are two separate things. And I do believe from what I've learned from the NTSB and what I've learned from, 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 from the NASA in-flight video and that course that I took a number of years ago, I do believe that ice bridging is a myth, but I'm wondering if this statement, we're trying to prove a negative, and again, when we get to an accident, it's all burned up in many cases, or the ice is melted off. So I'm just wondering if that, that we're trying to prove something that, that we're too far reaching with that statement. I mean, it's just a comment. I'm not going to say we've got to change it, but I, I, I think that we need, to, we need to think about that when we, when we write this again or perhaps say it a different way. And if I could also add, um, in terms of what has occurred during aircraft certification testing, testing that's gone on from NASA itself during research in freezing rain, from the de-ice uh, boot manufacturers, Goodrich, they've never seen it either. Okay, thanks. Maybe that would be more compelling than searching our database for something that may not be coded in there, but it's an editorial comment. Can you talk about the NPRM? I understand that uh, uh, I just signed off on it yesterday, myself, and I believe my colleagues have, have as well. The, uh, NPR, the NPRM coming out on the uh, Part 121 activation of ice uh, protection and uh, how that's going to potentially affect things. Yes, that, um, that NPRM is uh, going to require activation of the ice protection system as soon as a Part 121 airplane enters icing conditions, and in addition, a means for the crew to identify that in terms of a, either an ice detector or a set of atmospheric conditions that will define that, yes, they're in icing conditions. Um, however, as written, it's only applied to Part 121 aircraft, and uh, we've made no discrimination in our recommendation that the um, that the airplane's coverage should only be Part 21. We believe that any de-ice boot equipped airplane should be operated in that fashion. That includes all Part 91, Part 135 that are operated in that fashion. And those are not covered in the NPRM. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and there's also one additional discriminator that is included in the NPRM. Um, the FAA proposes to apply that regulation to only airplanes that have a gross Max gross takeoff weight less than 60,000 pounds, and there are 
currently in service, for example, the Q400, which is a de-ice boot-equipped airplane that does have a maximum gross takeoff weight greater than 60,000 pounds, about 64,000 pounds. And um, we feel that in the future, for not only that model, but other models which may be in the production line that have de-ice boots, they need to be covered under the same rule also. Thank you. Generally, I think, I think the, the feeling is, is that that NPRM, if enacted, will go a long way towards meeting some of the things that the Safety Board has been interested in, but it doesn't go quite far enough in, in those areas you just delineated. Yeah, I would agree. Um, that, in addition to the Part 25 rule that became effective last year, which is for new airplanes, that advocates or that requires all new airplanes under Part 25 to operate their ice protection system as soon as they enter icing conditions also. But there's still a gap for some of the Part 23 airplanes being operated under Part 91 and Part 135. Thank you so much. Vice Chairman. No questions. Thank you. Dr. Bauer, if they have um, gone to the trouble to address uh, the Part 25 aircraft, why would they have to initiate a completely separate um, arc uh, to look at the Part 23 aircraft? Uh, uh, that's sort of a mystery to me also. Um, I seem to recall in the uh, board meeting that was about a year and four months ago um, on our most wanted list uh, that I thought they had told us that they were going to uh, publish an NPRM based on the recommendations and the report from the ARAC that completed its work uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, did that happen in the last year and four months? No, it hasn't. And they told us it was imminent then, right? Yes, we're, I think we've been told it's been imminent since 2008, and we still have not seen anything. Do you have any sense of what the, uh, of what the holdup is, what the problem is? I believe the sense we've gotten has been, has been held up in the different committees and, and things that needs to go through in the FAA, um, Fair Language Committee, et cetera, uh, all these different things that I'm not too familiar with personally. However, we're told again, first quarter this year. I guess we'll wait and see. And I thought that was the whole point of having an ARAC was that it, uh, you're taking input from all of the potentially affected stakeholders in the industry t and it's supposed to, I thought, um, streamline the rulemaking process so that once the ARAC uh, reached conclusions that things were pretty well greased to help it move forward. Why do you want to send something to an ARAC for five or six years if when it comes out of the ARAC it takes five or six years to, ac to accomplish what the ARAC's recommendations are? No, I, I, sometimes when things come out of ARAC it's, it's not well greased at all. They come out with very differing opinions. Uh, sometimes those opinions don't match up with the regulatory process. It, it can be difficult. It doesn't come out as a ready-to-go item that can be dumped into regulations in many cases. It's, it's an unfortunate circumstance of the process occasionally. Yeah, I think my, my sense is just from the kind of uh, non-bureaucratic, you know, person who kind of understands all of these things, it's almost like like it's the elephant graveyard of rulemaking. It's like they just go there and they die. And it's been 10 years uh, since they decided to send it uh, to the ARAC, and we're still not any further along. And um, this continues to be an issue. It's not as if we haven't had accidents in the last 10 years. And so um, this one is just a real perplexing one. But as member somewhat mentioned earlier, um, we come here to talk about these issues um, and highlight them. but uh, like in the uh, uh, pilot proficiency area where we're going to have an opportunity to talk to the Congress about uh, the Colgan accident next week. Uh, we're also going to be testifying uh, on icing issues uh, before the Congress next week. And so um, uh, people are paying attention. I think there is an interest in understanding why it's taking so long to accomplish some of these, uh, some of these efforts. Dr. Bauer, was there a great dissent? in the ARAC when the conclusions came out of them, of the, of the ARAC? Regarding the expanded envelope, um, just conversations I've had with some of the researchers that were involved was that once the final concept was uh, developed that there was a fairly good consensus amongst the ARAC group. 
I don't know. It's just ba it's kind of baffling uh, sometimes, I think, even for people who are inside the Beltway to understand, uh, you know, uh, it's like voodoo rulemaking or something. I don't get it. It's like we need some special something to make to make it happen. It's uh, uh, the uh, I guess the good news is is if um, uh, if we're frustrated on some things, I think we also have to recognize that they did kind of advance the ball on a few issues. Um, and so uh, I would like to. Uh, uh, recognize that there is there is movement and to give credit uh, for those accomplishments. It, however hard it is for them to get this done, uh, they have moved some things out. And so uh, we'll look to the final rule. Hopefully they will listen to the comments that uh, that we have offered on the 60,000 uh, pound issue and the application to 135 and 91. The aircraft the aircraft doesn't know whether it's a Part 91 or Part 121 or 135 operation, it doesn't care. The ICE is going to treat it the same, and uh, you know the, the 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 risk to the people on board is still the same. Um, and so I I just don't understand how we can draw a divide a dividing line uh, along something that's a regulatory construct uh, that doesn't have any basis in science or the data that we look at. So, um, does uh, any other board member have any comments? Staff have a recommendation for us? Yes. Staff recommends that the issue area remain on the most wanted list, and staff also believes that the additional delays in issuing expanded icing envelope to include SLD and lack of overall progress, progress I'm sorry, warrant this issue area's action and timeliness de designation to remain red. Is there a motion? I so move. Second. All in favor, signal with a hand and aye. Aye. The ayes have it. The issue area remains on the most wanted list and retains a red designation. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Um, Ms. Rubber, we're ready to do another table switch. Yes. 